Let me get rid of all your ugly faces. <laughs> <laughs> There, all right. Um, it's funny because that on the, one of the one of the I/O groups, a guy had just built a car, and he intentionally screwed it up. He knew better, but he did it anyway, and he's happy with his model. And now he's talking about uh, these 1937 cars. Uh, AAR design, what what this car and this photo is. Uh, they have they came early cars had square corners, and then the rest of the cars, the majority of the cars, had what they call a W or a round corner, like this particular model. And he, he he's confused on that now too. We'll have to square him away. Uh, but anyway, I'm trying to get rid of as many models as I can from my. Uh, Scrap drawer, my my stash. Uh, before the today was a beautiful day, and I didn't do anything. So uh, uh, I sat outside in the sun like a turtle on a on a log. But anyway, this is uh, this car here came out of a box that was labeled. It was a red caboose box labeled uh, uh, AAR thirty seven design as Santa Fe car. It was decorated as a Santa Fe car. And I've been wanting to build a car with uh, Sunshine Gray Doors. Uh, years ago, Sunshine hosted the Naperville show, and they would always give away a little mini kit uh, to the participants. And one year, the mini kit was these grain doors. Uh, so decals on the car are from Mont Switzer, uh, who I consider to be the godfather of the Monon Mafia. So uh, I contacted him about these cars. And he told me if I chose this uh, 9150 to 94,000 or 100 series car, I could put uh, National B trucks under it, which is always nice to have at least one car on the railroad with those. Uh, this was pain. He also recommended using the scale coat to uh, box car red too. So these are the, the grain doors, the way they come. And I just sprayed them with some mud colored paint and then you cut them off and stack them up on the doors. One side has, uh, you can see the, the kind of um, blurry, the actual dimensions of, of how they were built. And uh, they're supposed to represent that. Uh, this is a picture, when you buy these kits, uh, Intermountain Red Caboose, any of the, gen they're basically generic. And uh, there's a lot of things that you can change on them. Uh, if you look at uh, the PDFs that Ed Hawkins put out on these various uh, AAR designs, he goes through every railroad and gives you all of the, the different appliances that were put on the car. So you can make yours as accurate as you wish to. Uh, now, the one thing about this car, it's an IMWX model, which was a predecessor to Red Caboose. And they use some a beautiful car but they use some real clunky uh, bracket grabs. So as you can see here, I replaced those with some spare red caboose ones I had saved. Uh, and as you can, from the photograph, you can see that uh, uh, the placard board on the end was on straps. Uh, I always replace um, the plastic uh, grabs down on the, on the sill with uh, wire ones. I always replace um, the, the sill steps with A-line steps, or I have used uh, Pierre Oliver Yarmouth's model steps before. They're a little fragile, but these things are, are bulletproof. I also added the, what's known as, a, engineeringly known as a, as a uh, roping staple, but at work we always call them pulling sloops. And I think a pulling loop is, is better than not really staples, but, uh, that's the way it is. Uh, this side shows you the side of the, uh, the shows you the trucks, the pulling pulling loop or the or the roping staple, um, the the style B A line uh, sill steps, and I had to remove uh, the pulling pocket casting from the corner. These cars did not have them on at all, but there was a problem. I had taken three car bodies 
I had stripped them and I put weight in them and I put them in a box. And when I went to build that car, I grabbed the wrong one. Instead of having the W or round corner car, I had grabbed a square corner car. So I wasn't, I didn't notice this until I was all done and I was putting a wash on it and I was painting the corner and I thought, oh, F, I screwed up big time. So anyway, here I've, I've scraped all the decals off, ripped off the doors, and uh, I have some uh, uh, Youngstown doors in order to turn this car into a Southern car. And basically it's removing stuff to put it back and <laughs> make to make a Southern car out of it. You remove the roping staples, you change the trucks, you replace the polling pocket castings. I cut those off a spare end and uh, remove the straps from behind the end placards. I had to add a truss plate. I noticed that in the photograph. Uh, decals are uh, speed, speed witch, but now sold through national scale car. And then I had to rebuild the Monon car again this time using the correct body with the round corners. And one thing, there is a silver lining to all mistakes. When I had done the first car, I was lazy and uh, I used a number 9490, not paying much attention to the actual uh, series, car series. Well, when I was doing this car, I actually noticed that these cars only went up to 94, 490, 49. And uh, so I would just flip the zero and the, or the nine and the zero to make a, a zero and a six to bring the car into the, the proper position on there. Um, one thing Mott did not put on his list, which I will have to chew him out about, is there's no reway uh, dates on it. But I happen to have some old champ uh, reway stations and reway dates. So I was able to add those even though they don't match the rest of the lettering. Uh, this is a poor photo I took out of a uh, um, um, real model journal. Um, shows a series of Rock Island cars. I have this 19, AAR 1937 modified car, which is six inches taller. The ends are, are have five at groups of, of corrugations on the top and five on the bottom, whereas the 10 foot high cars we just looked at had four on the top and five on the bottom. Uh, and we were at a hobby shop here a week or so ago. I picked up some uh, true color Rock Island uh, boxcar paint and a set of uh, Mask Island decals. So I uh, built the car in, in the information I could find there on the painting of the car, the roof was not mentioned. So if the, usually if they don't mention the roof, the roof was not painted. So I left the roof unpainted on the car, but did paint the seam caps, which was a fairly normal thing for them to do. Uh, I did replace, uh, back to making the car more prototypically correct. Uh, these cars came with universal handbrakes and I, because they were 10-6 car, I could use the total handbrake assembly that uh, Red Caboose, uh, excuse me, that Katie offers. And if I can move my mouse, yes, I can. It includes not only the brake wheel, but the brake uh, gear case, the chain and the rod and the, the fulcrum down at the bottom. So being this car is the right height, I can put that all on as one piece, which makes things simpler. And back up here. And again, um, not much else. This car was pretty straightforward. Uh, mask Island decals, like I said, true color paint. I'm not sure about the trucks. Looking at the photo of the trucks, um, I picked some out that I have no idea who made them that have uh, uh, something close to the correct uh, uh, profile. <laughs> Back the, the first time that a friend of mine went to the Naperville show, was about the third, second or third one they did. And we missed the next year. And during that, that year we missed, that's when Martin Lofton gave out this mini kit to make a door and a half uh, car for uh, uh, Central of Georgia. 
And these cars are really neat and they've haunted me for all these years. And the other day I asked if anybody had one of these mini kits left. And there's a person who had, does castings and another person who does, who does resin kits. And they had, he had the resin kit manufacturer had the, had the, the, the casting guy make a bunch of these kits because he was thinking about coming out with them again. So that fellow was kind enough to send me the kit, which includes basically the half door, the, the latch mechanism, and the addition to the uh, side sill. And then you have to add the everything. He also sent me a, a copy of the instructions from that old kit that's 25 years old or so. And uh, uh, so it said use Evergreen one by threes. And of course I did that. And then the usual thing of putting on the A-line corner steps and uh, and the ones on the ends. And this car is now painted. I used uh, uh, a KD uh, running board and I'm waiting for the decals. They're supposed to be in the mail. So uh, hopefully I'll have this done next week. The information for all these cars is in the, a series of magazines called the uh, Railway Prototype uh, Encyclopedia, or, or R RP Psych, we call it. I had two of them here. One of them shows there's a half a dozen photos of those Central and Georgia uh, door and a half cars. So you can, you can see they tell you everything you need to know about the cars <laughs> in, in, the, in, the, in the captions. I also had uh, another one out because I was doing, when we were also at that hobby shop, I picked up a, uh, a teaching uh, USRA single sheet car. So I got out the magazine on that so I could look up a picture. Uh, this is a Titchy car uh, after it's uh, put all assembled. These are really nice kits. Uh, they're really well engineered, although they are not without their flaws. Uh, some more than others. Uh, I just washed this and before I took the photo, so there's some drips of water still on it. Uh, this shows the end of the car. Uh, the only changes that I made to it from, from the photo of the, of the prototype I wanted to use is instead of using drop grabs at the, at the end sills, I used straight ones. And I added a second grab to the left side of the, of the side. The, the TG car only comes with the one grab that was what was added to begin with. Uh, it needs car mark cut levers, and I'm out of those. And I know Pierre Oliver at Yarmouth Models sells those. I'm going to have to order some one of these days. And then this is the car when finished. I had some, uh, um, some Westerfield decals. Uh, the decals were made for... Uh, a Fowler design car, which is a different uh, side structure to it. The, the bracing is different. Uh, but by just cutting the, the name apart in different places, I was able to put it on as, as the photo in the RP site. And then uh, again, uh, most of the time, uh, Westerfield, if, if he has reway dates on, they're too old. And he very seldom, if ever, puts in uh, repack data. So I got the the capacity and the uh, the repack and the reway data from a scrap set of uh, CNW PS1 decals from uh, Speedwitch. This is a basket case that was sent to me by from uh, John Golden. I think John Golden, he plays soccer. He likes soccer. I think he practices at home on his freight cars because he keeps sending me stuff that's broken all the hell. And uh, that's just not normal. <laughs> and this particular car uh, is a is a KD car, but it looks like he, he actually uh, decorated it for the Rock Island. Now, whether this car is correct, I have no idea. Uh, I have, um, the only way I'd look this up is I glanced through uh, the morning sun Rock Island color book and color books are, you might could wipe your butt with them because they leave off half the cars because they don't have color photos of them. 
So whether the chart is correct or not, I have no idea. Um, I added some weight to the bottom here. Some had to do to fix it. How he managed to break some of the holster off, I do not know. But I added some weight underneath, and it wasn't really heavy enough. So I put a bunch of uh, BBs in the bottom of the hocks, painted them black. Then when I put a set of trucks, I have no idea what trucks were supposed to be under these. So I just grabbed them, some out of my truck box and uh, slapped them on with uh, uh, these. I, these are uh, Proto 2000. I, I should, it's a good thing I write this stuff on here so I can remember what the hell I did. Uh, next car up, this car is really a neat car. I have better photos of it than this, uh, but I put this one in because of the photo I took of the car. Uh, these were built from gondolas in 1925. That's why the side sill looks the way it does with all the rivets and the, and the extra brackets. And then this is the model. This model is uh, uh, it's an Accurail uh, six panel car but I cut the roof off and replaced it with a radial roof that I cut off of one of the 50 foot uh, roundhouse, double door wood box cars that, that John Golden had given me on the last batch of, of uh, rejects that he sent my way. So this one here I've done today, uh, just I forgot when I, before I primed it to put these extra straps on and then I, put, I had primed it just so I could see where to put the rivets. So all these are Archer rivets on the car. And now it's ready to ready for paint. So it'll be done for the next show. Next car up <coughs> is a really different car. This is a, it was a 3D printed car, 3D resin. And it's a weird looking thing when you grab the thing out. Uh, it looks like uh, somebody threw a, car on top of a picket fence and the picket fence has tentacles that are coming up and grabbing the car and pulling it down. Nasty. Here's the, the underframe. Uh, before I cut anything off of it, you can see a lot of tentacles that are attached to the brake rods that all have to be cut off. These have all been cut off and uh, and the underframe is painted. I painted the, the car earlier uh, a couple of days ago and just put the decals on today. Uh, this one's not finished. This is what you get with the decals. And of course the, the chalk marks didn't come with it. Those are from national scale car, but there's no repack or reway data. So I just this afternoon went through or this evening actually before supper, went through uh, my stack of, of decals scraps, which is probably inch and a half high. And the very bottom one was from, for a, a Pierre Marquette car I had done before. So I was able to put the repack and, and reway data on one side of the car. I'll do the other side when that one dries. And that's it. All right. For now, or until I buy more. <laughs> Very good. Any questions for Clark? I'm wondering about the, uh, the decals. Uh, how are they, Clark? The ones you have from, is it Mask? Mask Island? How do no, you like which one? Are they thin or are they medium or thick or? The ones from Mask Island? Right. They are uh, medium to thin. I don't know how old, I've seen these decals down at, at the hobby shop for two or three years. She's had them and I had no problem putting them on. Let's put it that way. Okay. Sometimes I, mean, I grab I grab pieces of decal that are expendable, and if they fall apart, then I then I put on the the uh, the, the micro Microsoft or Microscale um, uh, decal uh, film. The, the liquid decal film. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I had, had to do that with the decals for that that uh, 3D printed car and they were printed. You know, everybody complains about uh, Speedwitch decals because you can't see them. These were painted, these were painted. They were white decals on white paper. <laughs> you had to hold them just right in the light in order to see the decal. 
Where is Mark Sarkozy? Got an Oop, I got an answer from that. Pardon? I have an answer for that with your white decal on a white paper. Take a magic marker, a black magic marker on the back side of the paper and rub it on the paper. It'll stain yeah. the paper and it will show the decal up. Yep. Yes, I've tried that before, but little or no success. But that's mean. <laughs> that's just oh, me. It works fine. Well, on on uh, on the blue paper, it works fine. Yeah, yeah. These were real. This was a real thick paper. I uh, have no idea. Yeah. And I had. To, I definitely. I was told to to put uh, the micro scale uh, decal film on over it. So I did that before I even cut any of them off. Hey, what is that's, uh, oh, I'm sorry. What is and the rope? Car, all the striations. Can you do anything about those striations on that 3D on that 3D printed car? Um, I suppose if you want, I don't know if you could sand them off or not because you'd lose all the rivet detail. Right. Um, it, it's okay. to me, it was a, it was a gift. So it is what it is. <laughs> Just it, but the decals, you know. You, they don't go into those durations and you've got to, I just take my knife and go back and forth and back and forth and slice okay. them up and, to, and then hit them with a Sabo set. Okay. What is the rope loop for? That's for, um, if, if you're, I'll, I'll, I'll let's put it this way. It, where I worked, uh, we had these, what they called uh, car pullers. Which is basically a motor in a oh. car case with a thimble that sticks up. Sure. And yeah. you would take up a, a heavy rope or a line of Navy people and with a hook on the end, you'd hook that hook into that loop and then you'd wrap that rope around that uh, the spindle when it was running and the tension of the rope would pull the car forward. Sure. Okay. That it's it's a car pulling system. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I, I kind of figured it's, that. Yeah, it's just a place to hook the uh without grabbing a lot of the ladder or something and ripping it off the car. Got it. Okay, thanks. Hey Clark, you know you yeah. finally you finally told me the answer to what those doggone grain doors were. I totally forgot what those things were. They've been laying in my box ever <laughs> since we got them. I was you know, looking at those things and what in the world are those things for? You know, <laughs> you know I ended up buying both those sets I have. Uh, I I don't pay way too much money for them, I'm sure. But, you know, you think about it, you only need about four or five of them, and then you just cut a whole bunch more pieces of styrene to match, and then you stack them all up and put the good ones on top. Well, I went into the, the, the uh, shop, and by golly, I still got them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you'll have to put them in a car. I will. <laughs> yeah, it takes four. But I would buy them because I put stacks of grain doors by all the elevators and all all of the, you know, every you look at pictures of stations, there's always a huge stack of grain doors next to them before they come out with the paper ones. Right. But the all nice right. thing to do with the paper one is to take some newspaper and put it on the inside of the doors, you know, tear it, and then take a piece of uh, black thread to for the, the actual... Uh, uh, metal that was inside them and that would whip around when the train was going by and behead you if you were too close to the track. Remember those? There actually was somebody that made kits of those doors. Yeah, you can buy them. Yeah. They're printed. They're just brown printed paper. But you know, that just brown paper. You, you know, you know, it's just like these wood grain doors. Under normal conditions, you would never see them because they put them in the car and they close the door yeah. or they load the car and they close the door. Of course, the guy uh, who the, I bought that from, he glued the door open. So the yeah, rain, that's what I, it, it, we run that car through the weather. With the <laughs> Mine car gets turned around when it gets loaded. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> Ron, it was a, a company called Jaeger that made those Signo doors. Yeah. Uh, the same outfit that made the wrappers for uh, wrapped up uh, lumber for uh, like center beams. Jaeger. I think they're still around. All right. Well, Clark, do you want to go on and do your other presentation? Well, I didn't have a, I, well, the only thing I was going to talk about 
was here the other day, a friend of mine put out a, like an hour long presentation on how to do a PowerPoint. And he went off into outer space, you know, <laughs> talking about how to manipulate photographs in different types of uh, a soft. And I'm thinking there's only three things you need to know to be able to do a PowerPoint presentation for any show, this show in particular. And if people knew how to do it, maybe you'd get more people to talk or people wouldn't have an excuse for not talking. And uh, I don't know if I, let me see what I can do here. Um, I'll share my screen. And well, I'll just take this one here. This is the one, this is the one we just did. Um, let me, I gotta minimize that, get rid of that. Are you, can you, what happened? Everything went black here. Yeah, do it one more time. Okay, you there, it's back, but I don't want the whole thing. Hit, a, hit your escape key. That was, that's what I did there. Okay, yep. Now I oh. lost everything again. Yeah, oh, no, sorry, I didn't think it was. All that. right, we'll start again. All right, share screen. I'm gonna hit share screen. Okay, now I'm gonna take. We're not seeing it yet. Okay, you're not seeing my screen. No. Nope. Well, how about if I hit share? There we go. Oh, you see it? there you go. Okay, so let's just, uh, how can I do this with what I'm already done? All right, we'll, we'll start. All right, I'll just take this. Um, Okay, we'll take this guy. Now you see there's a back, this this is, if you open up, I, I wish I could open up a new PowerPoint, but I can't, or I don't know how, well, maybe I can, let's see. Split screen. Well, okay, did you lose everything again? No. Nope. No. Okay, great. Let me minimize this. No, we lost everything. Minimize that. Minimize that. Okay, can you see that? Yes, no. Yeah, yes, we can. Yeah. All right. This is a new PowerPoint. Now, what you're looking at is this the slide. Um, and you see it says click to add title, uh, click to add subtitles. We don't want to mess around with that crap at all. So if you go on right up here in the toolbar, you'll see a layout. Click on layout. And there's one that says blank. You click on the blank, and now you just have a blank piece of paper. Okay, so now the other thing that there's two ways of putting a picture in here. One way is to go up to the top where it says insert and click on that. And then you want to add a picture. So you click on that. And then we're going to take this photo right here. Voila, notice it fits. It, it matches right in there. Now we're gonna need another slide if we wanna put in another photo. So there's a couple of ways of doing that. One way is to click on this slide and then right click and it should bring up and you can see new slide. You can click on that. Or if you wanna add a whole bunch of slides, you can use the control function, which is which is control C and then you hit V and look at all the slides you can make because C is copy and V is paste. So you have two ways of adding slides. I hope no one's lost me yet or I haven't lost anybody yet. So we'll do the other way of adding a slide, a picture. That way would be to uh, minimize this guy Go to your, I hope you're seeing all this. And we'll go to where we just were. Like, if you, if the, the, thing of, the thing of it is, you want to take pictures of your work as you're doing stuff. And we'll just pick this one here. We'll hit copy. 
I'm going to right click, hit copy. Go back to the presentation and then right click and hit paste. And look how huge it is. <laughs> it doesn't fit. But what you can do is right click and go down to where it says size and position. Now this is an older, my, my last computer had an 08 office on. When I had this new computer done, the guy who transferred everything over, you can't transfer Microsoft Office because it's only licensed to the computer that it's on. So he had a 2003 Office that he could add to my computer. So he put it on there. And it's not as friendly as the eight. And this other guy that was doing this other one I just saw had the newest version and it's totally different. Uh, looked like it would be a whole lot simpler. So if we hit size and position, now it gives us the height of the photo and the width of the photo. And very important down here, it says lock aspect ratio. Now I know that this picture, this slide is eight inches high and 10 inches wide. So if we just go here and we highlight that and we hit 10 and then we go down here and hit close, Voila, made the photo smaller. Now we can grab a hold of that photo and pull it back down where it goes. Ta-da. That is that. If you want to, if you want to, uh, another thing, if you want to crop this photo, if you don't, you can, that's easy enough to do. You hit format up at the top, go over here to crop, and you can take these guys here. If you grab this one and bring it down. I'm by what I'm doing here is I'm I'm uh, right clicking here to get this and then moving my finger on the mouse or in this case the keypad. Okay, so now we've done we've got showed you two ways of putting a photo and, and two ways of making slides. That's all you need to know. Now you want to add a photo. Uh, we'll go back to home and we're going to add some verbiage. We need a title, we need stuff. Up here in this little box, there's this little guy here, and that is your text box. Bring that down and you can type in anything you want. And then if you want to, you can go up here where it says shape fill. And we can pick a color that we want. And let's say we want to make it dark. And then we can go over here and, and uh, pick a color. Then we want to make it lighter. Excuse me, I need to, I need to highlight the letter. And then come over here and do that. And then if I want to make a, an outline around the edge, I can do this. And then let's say we want to put an arrow to something. We go back up here again. I got to get up here. I can't. The, the controls for the. Um, I can't get up there every time I go up there. But <laughs> I, never mind. But anyway, there's an arrow up there. I don't know if you're seeing what, what's happening to me. Yeah, we can see. We can't see. Okay, the, you'll, you'll see it see in the top row. The second one from the left is an arrow. You can click on that and bring it down. And then once you put that arrow, arrow in here, you can go over here to this shape outline and you can go to weight and you can make the arrow as white as you want. Yep. Like this. I made it that I just used the outline, but because I couldn't get to the arrow because the other thing come up. But that's that's basically it. You know, that's all the steps you need to know to make a PowerPoint for, for anything. Um, if you have the office and you're smart enough to take photos uh, and put them all in a file where you know where they are, you can either retrieve them by going up here to insert and picture or going to the file itself and uh, hitting copy. And this will bring it in and it brings it in to fit. 
if you copy and paste, it's not going to fit. It'll be too big, but you can adjust that. And that's all I got to say on that. Is there any don't forget questions? to save it. <laughs> oh, not? I don't want to save it, but yeah. Yes, you want it right up here as this little television. You click on that and save stuff. So if I click on it, it's going to say, where do you want to save this? And I'll say, I don't. So I cancel <laughs> that and I'll get rid of this. And it said, you want to save it. It's keeping, it's keeping me from screwing up. Right. I say, no, I do not want to. Oh, I didn't talk about the background, but that, that can be added by, again, right-clicking down here. What is this? Go away. Hmm. Going down here to format background. And it's going to give me my choices. I can use a, a solid color. Ta -da. I can use the gradient, which I used. I can use um, here at textures. And there's all kinds of these things. I'm just showing you what's easy, what's easy to find. Um, and then there's colors that you can change. Let me go back to so I find easy. Right here, color. And you can make it any color you want. And that's all there is to the background. But you know, if you it's repetition, just doing this over and over and over again, it becomes kind of boring to keep doing this stuff but anyway that's it that's my other talk i wanted to say i'm, I'm done Remember see the all these pictures these are all pictures that, these are all photos of the models that i just showed you and there's some of them here all of these guys here are of a model that i only showed you one picture of but i've got these because i may use them later on and that is that. All right. Well, yeah. thank you, Clark. Yeah. Hopefully, that shows you that it's not it's not rocket science. It's just um, three things you need to do. You yeah. need to be able to copy the the slides. You need to be able to put a picture in it. You need to adjust the picture, and you need to add captions. That's it. I'm Very done. Good. All Remember right. the days when you had to go to the camera store? And just hope, yeah. hope that the exposure was right. You don't have to do it again. Yeah. 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 Oh. Wait a week to get your stuff back. <laughs> Those Actually, days are gone. if you're going to talk, you don't need captions. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true, too. But a lot of times, it's, uh, you put them in here photo. to remind you. I put them in to remind myself what I'm supposed to say. Well, right. so do I. The, more, just the more stuff you put in there, the separate notes. more stuff you put in, the less people are going to read it. You want to keep showing them pictures to keep I agree. Going. All right. Well, Dave, you want to go next? Um, who else is going? My uh, you and Mark Carlson today. Um, I think I would eat up all the time. Um, so I would uh, defer. Okay. You can you can go next week. Mark, are you ready to go? You're muted, Mark. Oh, I think, well, you're not muted on here, but you're muted somewhere. We can't hear you. Oh, now you're muted on Zoom. No, we can't hear you. That sounds promising. No, no, with somebody else. There. Okay, Mark's given the universal system uh, symbol for it. go on to somebody else. So, Dave, may, maybe you should go. Dave is too long. I've got a short one. Oh, it's uh, so we got 20 minutes. I think Dave disappeared. 
Did we lose Dave? No, there he is. He's still here. Ron, do you have that picture I sent you? Yeah, I do. Is it possible to get it on there? Yeah, I probably can't find it. I don't know how to retrieve it. Okay, Dave's on. There we go. Okay, um, can you see an image? Not yet, but it says it's coming. It's working on it. There it is, yep. We can see a map with uh, St. Sylvester. Right. So I, I guess um, uh, the title of this program, if it has a title, would be Anatomy of a Siding. Uh, this is going to be a siding on my layout. Um, it's in South Milwaukee, Wisconsin, on the Chicago Northwestern. And uh, it's known as the Davis Avenue siding, but uh, most railroaders actually called it Badger siding because of the factory that it served. Um, and it's an interesting um, and useful siding to have on a layout because it had six and as many as seven um, uh, customers, if you will, on one fairly short siding. So that's what we're going to be talking about now. Um, and uh, uh, this map shows a double track main line on the Chicago Northwestern that's since been reduced to single track on the UP. But on my LA out, it's going to be uh, double track. Um, this is where it's going to be. And um, uh, because it comes off the railroad at an exact 90 degree angle, that's what I did. But I've been having some second thoughts about that. Uh, I could put more of the industries on if I made it um, uh, a lesser angle. And I think that's probably what I'm going to end up doing. Uh, notice that street sign up above. I, I purchased um, replica street signs for all the sidings on my layout that are uh, associated with particular roads or any feature that's associated with a particular road in the hope that um, people who visit the layout might actually figure out where they are. Um, if, if you're into researching a particular city in a particular era, um, a really good resource are the old city directories that most public libraries have. This one is in my own collection from 1911, which is way before my era. But the nice thing about a, uh, a city directory is that it, it, it goes street by street and shows you who was on the street rather than you getting a name and looking up to see where, where they were on a street. So in 1911, there wasn't much going on on Davis Avenue. Uh, you had um, uh, someone named Gramza, you had the Stevenson Motor Truck Company, and you had 11th Avenue intersecting, and that was about it. Um, I did do enough research to find uh, the Stevenson Motor Truck Company's products. This is a Stevenson truck, uh, which in uh, that period was a $3,500 item, which was a very expensive truck. But um, uh, that's way before my era, which would be the 1968 to 1970. So we're, we're on the Chicago Northwestern, now actually UP main line, and we're looking north and you see a siding there. That's not the siding. That's actually a newly created siding because the track to the right is the remnants of the second main line that has otherwise been ripped out. If you uh, uh, get down there, um, that's uh, uh, Badger siding or Davis uh, siding. And uh, for those of you with sharp eyes, uh, you are correct that uh, Bulkhead Flat uh, was pushed over a derail and is off the tracks. <laughs> now we'll go strolling up the siding just a little bit to give you a feel for what it looks like. Um, it's a very sharp curve uh, where those um, um, center beams are. Um, we will talk about at some length. That was a near a deep rock oil facility and the building behind it um, was Midwest Tannery. The siding then crosses Davis. And um, at the time uh, this picture was taken, uh, the tracks ended where you see the two uh, center flow hoppers. 
the building behind those hoppers is another tannery called Rapco. And um, some of the other things that I'd be talking about are no longer in existence and aren't in the picture. So um, uh, the uh, uh, Google satellite view of the of uh, Davis Avenue siding or Badger siding um, shows it going through sort of a grassy area. Uh, and the first uh, building that with the bluish roof is called Lutzau Industries. Lutzau Industries is the only building in this picture uh, that would still be um, on my layout in 1968. But uh, uh, another place where you can get aerial pictures, although um, they aren't anywhere near a Google satellite view quality, is historic aerials. So here we see um, Badger sighting. Uh, and if you look to the left, you can pick your year with historic aerial, aerials. This is 1955. And um, essentially, um, the first thing that comes up um, almost in the center of the picture is the Deep Rock oil facility. I can see one, two, three, four, possibly five tanks. And the Deep Rock uh, oil building is uh, that building at a slight diagonal angle. The 1963 um, uh, historic aerial was actually a much clearer picture. Uh, uh, with a smaller resolution, which probably helps. And here I can see six tanks and what looks to be a vertical tank right near the track and the diagonal building. That's more or less extreme left of the photo. Um, by the time I thought to take a picture of any of this, about all that was left was the, uh, the uh, vertical tank uh, a, a tiny fragment of the concrete supports for the tanks that were uh, horizontal. I definitely recall those tanks. You can see the uh, loading facility in the back, um, close up, and the uh, diagonal uh, structure uh, was still there. Uh, I think I took these pictures in the 1980s, late 1980s. Um, that's all gone, including the concrete uh, footing. I don't know why they bothered to remove it, but they did. But that would have been the first customer, the first real customer on, uh, on Badger siding would have been Deep Rock Oil. And I, they were still getting tank cars into the early 60s. Um, uh, I'm gonna create a little modeler's license. I'm gonna ex extend that into the later 60s just to give me another excuse to do some switching. It must have been a nightmare switching Badger siding with all the customers that were on it in such a short um, piece of track. Um, going back to the 55 uh, or aerial, you can see that diagonal building, but now the, the center of attention is the very large white roof structure near the tracks that is Midwest Tanning, which again, I had a chance to photograph fairly amply before it was torn down in favor of a new Walmart. Um, it's a, a mix of many different buildings all blended together. This might be uh, what, what that uh, Stevenson Truck Company uh, originated in. I do know that before it became a tannery, it, would, it made uh, ceramic tile, and then it became a soap factory and finally became a tannery. The reason I, I was able to trace all of that is by going to the library and finding all the city directories uh, year by year and seeing when things stopped being one kind of company and became another. What's interesting about the far um, left side of the building, um, which faces the tracks, uh, is that if you look towards the back of the picture, and this is a cropped version of the same picture, there are loading docks. I believe another part of this siding once came parallel to this building and served these loading docks. I have no proof of that and I'm not gonna do it on my layout, but uh, I can't think of any other reason why they would have had loading docks on this side of the building. There really would have been no room to back a truck up to it given where the embankment of the uh, Northwestern Railroad was. Anyway, 
uh, uh, that had uh, hides pardon. in there. Have you ever been around a car, box car that had hides in it? You wow. I can't, I can't. Never mind. I'll tell you later. Yeah, I, I can't. Uh, I can't uh, make it out what you're saying. This is as they were getting ready to tear uh, Midwest Tanning down. Whoa. This is a, a view of its eastern face. I, I think the very oldest is that uh, two-story portion. And I think that's where those predecessor factories uh, were located before it became a tannery. It's just a cropped version of the same picture. Um, a friend of mine in 1972 took a picture of um, yeah, Midwest actually unloading a um, freight car of presumably green hides. Um, he recalled it as being a New York Central car. And it's kind of a low car. I don't know if that's a 10 foot, six inch car. That might be just 10 foot. Um, the second picture that he took showed that uh, Midwest was using that truck to unload the car. I also remember them having some little um, four wheel little carts that they would use to unload the box cars that brought in uh, the green hides. Um, once a car is in green hide service, there's nothing lower <laughs> that it can be used to except maybe fish meal. So um, the second industry on this siding would be um, the Midwest tanning. So there, We've gone really just a few feet off the main, and there's already been two industries. Lutzau uh, Industries, which you can see again in this uh, Google satellite view, makes plastic bags. Originally, Lutzau was a dry cleaner, and they, and they had the novel idea back in the very early 50s, instead of putting their dry cleaning in paper um, co covers, uh, which some dry cleaners still do, they would use plastic bags, but first they had to get a source of plastic bags. So they started making them themselves. They made, um, uh, they ended up just closing the dry cleaner and became a plastic bag factory. <laughs> this is what it looks like. It's been greatly enlarged from what I remember in uh, 1968. Um, and fortunately, and this would be another research source, uh, Lutzau has a website. And on their website, they post old photos. Uh, not to help model railroaders, but it sure helps out that way. Uh, this is the factory as I remember it, with a nice green lawn and those kind of squat uh, storage bins uh, on the left side. A clearer version of, of the factory appears in another picture from their website where you get to see the whole happy family. Uh, but this actually uh, gives me uh, just about everything I need to start modeling. Uh, even including something I totally had forgotten about, and that was the planters that were on either side of the office door. And their website also had an interesting picture of one of their um, uh, uh, early loads, which was uh, a Dow uh, air slide uh, covered hopper. And they have an interior shot, which doesn't mean much really to me as a model, except it shows they had a forklift. Um, the back side of the factory is pretty much as I remember it, except that this alley wasn't paved, it was gravel. And this uh, uh, peaked roof is new. Uh, that was not the way it looked back in the, uh, in the older days. But you can see the kind of tanks they, uh, they have and still use. So uh, the third industry would be uh, uh, Lutzau. And the interesting thing about Lutzau and in, and in and a number of these plastic bag factories is they get their covered hoppers filled with pellets, but the uh, covered hoppers actually across the street, you could have an industry um, and a busy one uh, had no structure. Um, uh, this is just uh, some detailed pictures of uh, what is there to unload these cars and the, all of that goes under the road and into the factory. This is the... Uh, uh, the system that they had uh, in the 80s versus the pictures, uh, the prior pictures were from more recent. Um, the building in the background, since I'll be mentioning it later, is uh, Rapco Tannery. Uh, and at this point, the tracks ended 
at 11th Street. They did not go past Rapco anymore. But at one time, the tracks went further east, as we saw in that very first map. But before we get to Rapco, there's another business that uses this siding, and that is uh, it's a team track for lumber yards. Uh, that was true in the 60s, where the lumber yard was about a block away. Um, even today, a lumber yard from the next town north, known as Cudahy, Wisconsin, um, gets loads of its lumber here on this siding and unloads it uh, using it as a team track. Um, if people in South Milwaukee well remember when that Cudahy outfit got their first load on a center beam hopper, but they didn't know what a center beam hopper, I mean, center beam flat car, but they didn't know what that was. So they just started unloading and it, only until they uh, uh, took enough of the load off did they see the instructions never to load entirely one side at a time. You, you take some off of both sides uh -huh. and yes, they are over. <laughs> I don't have pictures of that, unfortunately. Here's that other tannery, the Rapco tannery. When I took this picture, it was no longer a tannery. The, the far end of the building away from the photographer was making exercise equipment. Uh, but this, the, both tanneries were in operation at the same time. Both got boxcar loads. Um, interestingly, while for some reason, um, um, Midwest tannery, almost all their hides arrived in steel boxcars, Almost all the hides for Rapco arrived in single sheathed uh, wood cars. I definitely remember a uh, Green Bay and Western and I think a nickel plate. And at least one of them had a built date of 1919. Um, and this would have been in the 60s. Yes, already. <laughs> and boy, did they smell. They're, they're just horrible odors coming from these two tanneries. And I think they were pretty miserable places to work. But now we've, you know, we've basically gone through two tanneries, an oil dealer, um, a plastic bag manufacturer, and a team track. So we're up to five uses for this one fairly short siding. Another view. Hello. Um, oh, I should return to that prior view because uh, at one point, according to the city directories, at the Right at the far end of this picture, there's a major road called 10th Avenue, also known as North Chicago Avenue. And there was a ice and coal dealer there. I've never seen a picture of it. And it was there for not so long a period of time, maybe 15 to 20 years. Um, but I believe it was on this side of the street. And uh, in the 1955 aerial, you can see at the far left how North Chicago Avenue curves slightly. And um, there's a number of buildings there that might, yeah. oh, well. might be the uh, right. That might be the ice and coal company. Uh, the last uh, building on this siding was the one that gave it its name of Badger Siding, and that's the Badger Malleable Company. That was still there and uh, in business in the late 1960s. These pictures are all much earlier. It somewhat resembles some of the Walters structures and that's probably what I'll end up using. But it had uh, two tracks that served it and uh, it, it may have had its own locomotive at one point. So that's my story. That's the anatomy of a siding. On one siding, seven, potentially even more customers uh, within two, two and a half city blocks. So that's it. Very nice. Thanks, Dave. All right, any questions for Dave? All right. Well, we'll get Mark's audio figured out next week, and Ron's got some stuff to show. Brian Enney is also going to present next week. So this format with having a few guys go on a night, it seems to be working for people. So we'll keep doing that for a while until uh, we run, run that dry, and then <laughs> we'll go back to the old way. But uh, thanks, everybody, for coming tonight, and we will see you next week. See ya. Bye-bye.